Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I go through the current iteration of my Sunday sermon. Over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at the books of Ezra, Haggai, and Zechariah at the post-exilic situation with the Temple of God. Uh, we had Jeremiah's prophecy that God's Spirit would descend on, God's presence would come upon his temple, it would be the new Jerusalem, and the nations would flock to the people. We saw images of this in the book of Zechariah. We saw images of the coming king, but we also saw signs that this king would be rejected. Now, Zechariah says this very clearly in Zechariah chapter 8. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come, and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, Let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going, and many people and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, Let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. With all of this ringing in our ears, we come upon Ezra chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you, because like you, we seek your God, and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esar has these Persian names, Esar Hadon, king of Assyria, had brought us here. Well, this seems like a golden opportunity. Isn't this the fulfillment of the prophecy where the, the, the people of the world are wanting to come to Jerusalem to help rebuild the temple and participate in, in everything that God is going to do? Well, it would seem the answer should be obvious. Well, like many things in the world, the answer wasn't terribly obvious at all. These, What had happened when the northern kingdom was destroyed was that many of the people of the northern kingdom back in, in the 8th century and back in the 8th century were taken out of the place that they were living in Samaria and in the northern kingdom. Now this is during the reign of the Assyrian Empire, and these, these different empires had different strategies about how to manage the people that they conquered. The Babylonians tended to take ex exiles and bring them to Babylon, take the brightest and the best from, from Jerusalem, and educate them, you read about this in the book of Daniel, and assimilate them into their politics and into their religion. The Assyrians practiced much more of a divide-and-conquer thing, where they'd take people and they would scramble them with people of other lands. They would sort of mix the people up. This is sort of a what God did at the Tower of Babel, and you kind of mix people up, and, and then they can't organize to resist you. And what that meant was not only were people taking out, taken out of the land and mixed with other peoples and other places in the Assyrian Empire, but other conquered peoples from other places in the Assyrian Empire, most notably down there in the in the in the Fertile Crescent, were taken and resettled into Samaria and into the land. And when the southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians, it's quite likely that people from the north saw opportunity and over those fifty years began to migrate down. And what you had was a great mixing of people. Now, we here in America like melting pots and mixing and diversity and all those kinds of things. But people aren't always so sure about that. Now, now it seems that many of these people who came down did what many ancient people did in those days. In fact, we read about the children of Israel, the children of Israel coming over from Egypt and settling in the land. They settled in and they basically asked their neighbors, well, well, what God is in charge here? And they heard, well, it's the God of the Jews that's in charge here. And so everybody, well, they'll make their sacrifices to the God of the Jews so that as they practice their transactional religion, the God of the Jews will help their crops grow and bring the rain on time and make sure that their, their ranch animals and their wives have lots of babies. This is what the gods are for. And so it seems perfectly normal that the people that were living in Samaria, that we might call them Samaritans, that's what they'll be called later on, that these individuals will in fact start 
worshiping the God of Israel. No, worship the God of Israel very much with the motivation and the mindset that they worshiped with their other gods. Now this sets up Zerubbabel's answer. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Now it's very interesting that they're living now within a cosmopolitan major empire. And so here you begin to have the sense that, well, these people don't play well with others. They don't mix well with others. In fact, they never have. They've got very particular ideas about their religion. They think their religion is the best. They think their God is on top. And so here's a rubble rebuffs them. Now, what do you think of that? Do you think he should have? Do you think he should have welcomed them in? What should he have done? There's a lot that goes on in this, a lot that Today in America, we don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to when it comes to exclusion and embrace. To choose something is, in fact, to not choose something else. We see this very clearly when in marriage. You choose to discriminate against all other viable partners when you marry someone. In fact, it's right there in the marriage vows, forsaking all others. If you fail to discriminate against these other viable partners, you will get a very strong reaction from your spouse. And in fact, there's a word for this. We call it adultery. And even after the, even after the sexual revolution in the United States, where people have quite a bit more libertine ideas about what sexual morality should be, cheating is still a very powerful word with just about everyone. Now, this gets played out in communities as well. To be a community is to have some aspect of the group of people differentiate you and define you. It is to be exclusive with respect to a particular aspect. So the community of dog owners does not include people who don't own dogs. Now, there might be a dog club that includes people who love dogs, but the community of dog lovers does not include people who hate dogs. And what happens is that communities develop institutions and organizations and express the desires and the aspects around which communities are developed. Now, what we have currently in American politics is a huge amount of talk about communities. We had a chant at a presidential rally, which was send them home. And we had some presidential tweets on that. Um, Ayanna Presley, who was one of the people that the president tweeted at, recently had a speech where she said these words, we don't need any more brown faces that don't want to, to be a brown voice. We don't need it. We don't need black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't need Muslims that don't want to be a Muslim voice. We don't need queers that don't want to be a queer voice. If you're worried about being marginalized and stereotypes, please don't even show up. This is pretty dramatic language. And in fact, it seems that only white people get to have their own voices if you follow what she says. And this just doesn't seem to hold true because I know lots of brown and black people and they all seem to have their own ideas and their own voices. And most of them aren't real keen about someone defining what they should think or what they should believe. In fact, that's pretty much the definition of, well, at least how we used to define racism. We have this culture war going back and forth. And we seem to not quite know what a community is or how to define one or what an identity is or or who should define someone's identity should this one congresswoman's ideas of what black faces uh, or what brown voices and black voices and muslim voices and queer voices should say define them can donald trump decide who's in and who's out of this country based on where they're born these are the kinds of discussions that are really heating up our politics. Now, what happened after this group got rebuffed was not so good. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. 
They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and down to the reign of Darius, King of Persia. Now we learned from Haggai that Haggai was calling out the people for not building the temple and Zechariah was encouraging the people to build the temple, but it seems apparently there was more going on. And in fact, if you continue to read Ezra chapter 4 and Ezra 5 and then into Ezra 6, you'll see that the whole flurry of letters and administration goes by. And this goes by over many, many years as they basically fight with the Persian government to get permission to build this temple and to get the Persian government to pay for it. And it culminates in chapter 6. Then because of the king, because of the degree King Darius had sent, he had... Darius had sent, he had read the, he had, his librarians had found the decree that Cyrus had made. So basically the, the returning exiles won. Uh, Tatanai, the government of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bazanai and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of his house of God, they offered a hundred bulls and two hundred rams and four hundred male lambs, and as a sin offering for all of Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what was written in the book of Moses. Now pay attention, they're paying attention to the detail, because they don't want to violate the covenant. On the fourteenth day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. Now this is really important because the Passover during the Exodus defined Israel. By the blood of the Passover lambs, they were defined. The priests and the Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, what we get here is a slightly different picture than what we got in chapter 4. It seems that not only do you have what were called in chapter 4 these enemies, but now we have this other group, and this other group seemingly has come down, and they've been watching what's going on, and they've made decisions about the conduct of their life, and they not only have decided to join the exiles in pursuing the rebuilding of the temple, it seems that they in fact have been welcomed into this, but there has been a criteria by which they have been welcomed. And it seems to be based on their behavior not their bloodline. For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria. Now that's a, that's a problematic thing, uh, the king of Persia, but you know why Assyria? That's, that's an ongoing debate in terms of the Bible. So that he assisted them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. But here we have the beginnings, not necessarily the beginnings, but here we have one of our first insights into the Samaritan problem, and this will become a major piece of the conversation when we get to the Gospels at Jesus' time. These people who came from someplace else, they're not the blood of Abraham, but remember that it wasn't just the children of Israel who left Egypt, the so-called rabble, Rabble left Egypt, and some people were, in fact, brought into the nation of Israel, even though they weren't direct descendants from Abraham. In fact, you had this through the covenant of circumcision, and that was the way that people could enter into the covenant, even if they didn't, they weren't from the same group ethnically. 
people who think um, you have people who think they are worshiping God. That's in fact what they said, but the others say they're doing it wrong. You have political and religious ad adversaries that say we are right and you are wrong, and of course the other side returns the favor because of course everyone thinks they're right. If you don't think you're right, you change your idea and then you think you're right. But what if you don't have the right blood? or skin color, or country of origin, or voice, or what have you? What if I fail to practice the right thing, or aren't even sure of what's right with all the confusing voices around me, or I'm less sure of the loudest voices who think they're most sure? In fact, often we find ourselves exactly in a position like this. Now, if you jump over to the Gospel of John, there's a very interesting story. Jesus is traveling from Galilee in the north where he was living down to Jerusalem in the south to participate in a feast. And well, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptized. Excuse me, he's going up north. Um, and so he went back to Galilee and they had to go through Samaria. And Samaria, of course, is filled with all of these people whose descendants went back to this resettlement policy from the Assyrian Empire. Now remember, that's seven, eight hundred years. So this is a very, very long time. This is longer than Europeans have been in the United States. Now we had to go, now we had to go through Samaria. So he went down in Samaria to Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and then a conversation ensues. Conversation based on, in many ways, this old conversation between Zerubbabel and the people who lived around, who, at least on the surface of it, claimed they wanted to participate in the building of the temple. What you'll see in this passage is that, in fact, this conversation continued. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, because the Samaritans worshipped God on Mount Gerizim. And in fact, they had their own book, which was sort of like the what we call the Old Testament, that was in some ways a little bit different, that showed themselves as God's chosen people. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. It's interesting that the Father is seeking worshipers. He's not passive. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm not going to go too deeply into this passage. I'm doing the Gospel of John in the adult Sunday school class, and I'm sure I'll go into it there. But in many ways, Jesus is attempting to resolve exactly what happened with Zerubbabel's temple. Today, we have a conflicted social and political environment to navigate. In Christ, you have a new identity, not based on blood, not based on country of origin, not based on skin color, not based on your capacity to comply or fulfill or achieve. It's based, however, on his spirit's capacity to move you. Now, move you to do what? Well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That goes all the way up to including your enemies. So both sides of that political divide that I just mentioned. The people who are different from you, and the people who are a lot alike you. Sometimes it's hardest to love the people closest to you. So what voice should you bring to that conversation? I would suggest you should bring Jesus' voice. Well, what does Jesus' voice sound like? Well, John 10 will say that the sheep of his fold know his voice. And if you want to know his voice, you need to know him in order to speak like him. 
that's the, for the voice you should bring.